nicht aufsetzen. <lacht> web track at full capacity uh, maybe like 110 percent mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome so um, today and now we will hear Michael talking about um, web APIs for the real world I don't know who can use this but um, let's see about that so give it up for Michael so, one or two people I hope can use this here. Yeah, so for those who don't know me, I'm Michael Mamoff. I'm going to skip a big intro because there's a fair bit to cover. But um, what I work on is a product called Player FM. And uh, to set some context, context for the talk today about APIs, um, it's kind of like something I've done a lot of is, is de this big debate of web versus native. Player FM, it's a cloud-based podcast app, so you can sync your settings and subscriptions across different devices. It started off as a website um, and still there today as a website, but it's also very much native. Um, so what's interesting about having this kind of the, the two web and native is actually at the back ends these days, you know, you can have 50 different interfaces, 50 different views into your world, um, but all of them are running on the same API. Uh, a website itself is kind of an API to some extent. It's an API for the browser to show users interesting information. Um, but more to the point, a modern, uh, a modern uh, website, uh, a little bit like what we saw in the previous talk and when we are talking about Angular as well, um, it's running all these Ajax calls going back and forth to an API anyway. The future is full of all sorts of different devices and gadgets uh, that will again need to be syncing with cloud services. So this is why APIs have become such a big topic recently. Uh, I was speaking at another conference a little while ago and because my name was on either the attendee list or the speaker list, I noticed I got this extraordinary amount of spam from salespeople who would be at the conference. They, they, I think they pay for the, the, the speakers list or something. And they're, all, and they're all telling me about their API. They're saying, you've got this app, so I, I assume you must have an API. You must, let's talk about how we can help you with your API. And it seems to be this new, almost like a bubble in APIs. Um, so I think we're starting to see this trend everywhere and just everyone's recognizing the importance in industry of APIs. And what it gets us to is, is the Internet of Things because um, very much everything online these days is going way beyond just mobiles and, uh, and computers and so on. And it's getting us into um, all sorts of gadgets um, that of course we're seeing some of them talked about uh, here. Um, Nest would be one of the, the examples of this. So. You guys might have seen this. It's kind of very Apple-y. It's from a former Apple executive, and it's uh, so they've got a thermostat now. They've got a smoke detector. Um, this is actually when someone actually went and looked at the the uh, protocol it's using, which isn't public yet. But um, of course, it's going to be using HTTPS and JSON, all these standard technologies that have emerged from the web. Then there's of course Google Glass. Um, Google Glass as well. Um, it's, again, a very sort of futuristic device. It's the kind of device that Tim Berners-Lee probably wasn't imagining um, back in, at the start of the 90s when he was coming up with the web protocols. And yet, you know, Google comes out and we've got the Mirror API, you know, this which is actually REST-based. So this is how we actually send content um, from, uh, from any kind of client, you know, into the phone, into, the, uh, the, into glass. And, uh, whoops, and then, uh, oh, <laughs> Yeah, and, and we have to thank, uh, and we'll thank Gerwin here for um, providing a, a mirror API simulation, which is, of course, going to be using the, the same REST protocol. So this is, uh, this is Apple, you know, you know the, the old PC versus Mac, and this is like an even older version of this. This is a, this is a Mac, and this is a PC, and these are, these are the Mac and PC from, from the t around the time when the, when the web was actually being born and, and all the standards emerging. And, and again, you know, both of these guys, they can both get online. They can both get on the web. 
um, in the early 90s. And this is why the web flourished. This is why the web became so big so quickly. Um, it's because the, the protocol was actually designed for all of these different devices um, to be using um, the same set of same set of standards and and then they could interop and one one you know you could have a, a Mac uh, serving a, a website to a, a PC or a PC serving a website to a Mac. Tim Berners-Lee uh, when this was actually from the Olympics uh, the opening ceremony they actually showed him with his original uh, Next box um, and uh, the you know he was he was on a Next he was using Next so again a different operating system um, probably something that not many people here have used did ever, anyone use a Next ever? Okay, more than, more than I thought. It was about five people. I never had the chance. Um, I was using a bit of Linux and Solaris and, and Windows at the time, um, but I was still able to use the web, you know, because because of the way it was designed um, using these open protocols. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is the the kind of fundamentals of REST. I want to cover uh, the basics and it's kind of like, it's always hard to know, um, to get the right level for a talk like this, you know, I'm sure people are coming from different levels, so some of this is fairly fundamental stuff, and then we'll talk more about some of the higher level advanced principles for how you can actually design your APIs using these principles. I want to talk about tools as well, because I think sometimes we forget about that there are actually some pretty powerful tools you can take advantage of, and, uh, and some of the trends that are happening with API development. So... It all starts from having cool URIs. You know, you want nice, clean, simple URIs like this. You don't want URIs like that. Anything that ends with .aspx, question mark, something, um, <laughs> be very careful. Uh, developer experience is a term that I coined a few years ago. It was actually at the Google Developer Day in Germany three years ago. And it's a term, yes, indeed. And. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, you can you can still find the original tweet. I, I coined it in a tweet, and uh, and it's since been used by Eric Schmidt, and it's and Amazon actually has a developer experience team now, which is really exciting to see, um, because really what the term is getting at is is it's user experience for developers, right? So it's basically saying like developers are people too, they should have awesome experiences when they're using their you, when they're using your API, uh, they should feel passionate about it. They should have this emotional connection just like they feel about their phone, you know, their favorite phone or their favorite social network. Um, they should feel the same way about your API. It should be awesome. And, and so doing, doing things the right way, doing things using REST means using these sort of standard conventions. And the fundamental one here is related to that cool URI. It's basically, what, what does that term mean? When we hear the term URI or URL a lot of the time, stop and think about what that actually means. Um, it's really referring to a resource, and preferably I would have, it would be nice if it would be just called a thing or an object, but you know, it's just things that are, that are sitting on your server. You've got models of things in the world that are sitting on your server. And REST means designing your API around those things, because once you do that, there are standard ways for, for any client to manipulate those things. Um, where it's different is from what we had in the past is a sort of more procedural sort of thing where you, you think of everything the user might want to do. Um, so in the case of Player FM, it would be things like, you know, the user wants to subscribe to this topic. So we're going to create a service, subscribe to topic. Um, with REST, we don't do that. With REST, we just, we just create a concept called subscription. That's our thing. And now every client in the world knows how to manipulate this thing, subscription. So it's kind of seeing things in a slightly different way, um, but thinking about what are the actions that need to take place in your system and conceptualizing everything as a thing that can be manipulated. Once you do that, it's extremely straightforward. It's extremely good developer experience for anyone actually using your API. So this is an example of a platform, GitHub. Um, so you could say this is a top level thing, just a website. And then it goes sort of recursive. So there are standard conventions for how you construct URLs. I'm not going to get into all of that today. There's loads of resources on it. But this is, of course, you know, another thing. A slash Google is like a, a user within GitHub. And then it goes further again. You've got, you know, Google has got this its own namespace. So things inside Google. This is a project inside uh, inside that that user. And and. We can manipulate all three of them. You can do things with all three of them. So if you wanted to 
Um, theoretically, if it was an API, you know, you could actually update, you could upload a new version of this project, you know, and you would do it to that URL. And you can actually use that URL at a higher level to, to pass it to other things as well. So if you wanted to create a collection of your favorite projects, then theoretically you can, you can create to pass URLs like that. So as URL is like the fundamental way of identifying things, hence the name Universal Resource Identifier. And those standard mechanisms that I've talked about are shown here. So there's, you know, we've got get for just reading a, a resource, put for, uh, for, for actually changing it, editing it, or inserting it if it's not there. Um, if you can actually name the thing, you can actually put it there. It's like a, a hole sitting somewhere on the server that, that you can plug into. You can delete it, you can post. Um, post is, is uh, kind of a little bit more ambiguous, but basically post is a little bit like putting, but where you don't actually know what, where it's gonna end up. And there are other verbs as well. So you, know, you can define other verbs, like there's new ones like patch, um, but those are the fundamental ones to be aware of with any API. So how does it, uh, how does it look you know, when you click on a browser or when you make a get call from an API? Uh, this is the basic flow that happens. So you've got, uh, you've got some text going in and you've got some text going out. And the text going out has got headers. It's like key value pairs. And the text going in has got key value pairs too. If we were sending something, we'd also have a body here. So it's just headers and body, just like an email. Um, pretty straightforward. In fact, a lot of REST and a lot of HTTP is actually a pretty straightforward protocol when you get down to it. When you think of it, it's just sending some documents back and forth. It's, it, you know, it's, it's actually what it's building on. The, the reason, again, the web was so successful and the reason these protocols are so successful is it's actually building on a very intelligent stack, you know, an intelligently designed stack of, of all the cables and how you're getting uh, packets going back and forth and making sure that if you, if you send something and it doesn't get there, then you, the, so you can, it can be resent. All of that stuff is taken care of. And when you're looking at the, the level that you're operating on at an API level, it's just you know, sending these, these documents with key value pairs at the front. So how it actually looks is you know, we're saying here we've, we're going to this host um, GitHub and we've got the, we're asking for this particular resource. There's some uh, content information. We're asking what we're saying, what kind of content we want that, what format we want it in, and then it will just come back and gives us an error code and come back. So we can look at that in a little bit more detail. So with the content, as I've said, you know there are these things that exist somewhere, but then what we want to do is we want to actually say we want it in this particular format, and then we get it back in that format. We get an error code. So these are the codes. We, we, there, are, there are standard codes for, for how, how the responses are coming back. Um, and, and I think as programmers, most of us have done this kind of thing, right, with error codes. You see this a lot in, in, in old school, um, you know, command line scripts and whatever, where they'll just say error 943. You know, it's like pretty standard trope in, in all programming. So HTTP did the same thing. It just standardized those errors. It just said, like, why don't we agree on, on the same errors so that all these codes mean the same thing for every API, every web server. And, uh, and you can look them up. And, and those you should take advantage of, right? You should actually use the, the error codes. Try to understand for a given situation in your own API, um, what, what does this mean? What's the closest thing this maps to? It won't always be a perfect mapping and sometimes you'll have debates. You can, you can look online, there'll be lots of debates about, you know, should this be a 403 or should it be a 401 or whatever? There's always gonna be debates about it, but try to find the closest thing and that will help your, your users of your API and it will also work with, with the, all the different infrastructure along the way. Because a lot of this is not just about patterns, it's not just about common ways of doing things to make things easier for everyone. It's also about actually efficiency, right? Because a lot of um, proxies and caches and browsers and servers, they all rely on these sort of standards. Um, the picture is actually taken from a project called HTTP Status Dogs, which came from another project called HTTP Status Cats, which I encourage you to check out. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is just showing, like normally you get a 200, error, 200 response. Um, you know, that's the standard thing when you see a happy web page uh, in your browser, but it doesn't have to be. There are other 200, there are other success codes as well in the 200 series. There's uh, redirects. So redirect is like when we talk about user experience, developer experience, you know, redirect is all about that in a way, right? It's all, all about being tolerant of errors because a lot of the time, 
effectively it's kind of it's not the not the it's the client's fault or the user's fault, but it's basically saying like you've just asked me for something that doesn't exist. So it's actually about being nice. It's about being giving a nice experience, saying actually it's over there instead. So we're going to pass it on. And there's different kinds of redirects. And again, this actually makes a difference because if you have a, a permanent redirect then um, you better be very careful about that because the user might never see the original one again if you wanted to change it later on. And then you've got your 400 series as well. Uh, so I think everyone's very familiar with 404 being the most common one, but again, you know, there are lots of different kinds of errors that can take place and all of these are codified by the standard. Um, another one here that I'm showing is 403 that's also quite common. Um, and, you know, f and we'll get into the, the security aspect. So. So yeah, secondly, I want to cover a little bit about you know how we're we actually designing our APIs, and uh, let's talk about uh, one thing. So this is this has become a, a pretty pretty popular topic of late. So the fundamental principle of uh, of REST security is really about it's it's going away from security by obscurity. So I, I showed you that ridiculously long URL before. A lot of the time, URLs. One reason it might be used like that is, is some sort of attempt at security, right? It's like making some ridiculously long URL um, that no one could ever think of and, and, and you know, using some uh, obscure way of getting to that URL um, and then that's, that's your security. The way REST does it is a little bit different. REST basically says, like, keep your requests as simple as they ever were, make them open, make it possible for someone to, to find out how you delete your whole database with just, you know, with just a single URL. But the difference is that they're going to be identifying themselves and the server's going to say, yeah, no, that's not happening. You know, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not authorized to actually um, make that request. So the actual, it's, it's quite good from a programmer's point of view because you, you get to keep things simple. You can even develop it without having that security layer there initially and then you can bolt it on um, once, once that's there and once you understand how it's going to be, how it should work. Um, so yeah, so it's about, it's about keeping things, uh, keep your, your request simple and then of course you're going to use some mechanism, mechanism of the user identifying who they are and the server can then can then check using standard authorization procedures, authentication procedures, um, if they are who they say they are. Another fundamental principle nowadays is to use SSL everywhere. Um, it's become increasingly obvious that you can't rely on uh, just sort of again a kind of obscurity model and hoping that no one's going to be listening to Wi-Fi communications and ISPs aren't going to be listening to traffic. It's it's becoming very clear that that everyone needs to be using SSL and, and particularly for APIs, it's becoming standard. Um, the, that, that's kind of on, on the demand, on the, um, let's say the demand side, it's becoming much more important, but also on the, the, the supply side, if you like, the, 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 it's actually a lot easier to um, now. Nowadays, it's a lot easier to do SSL as well because, um, because it's just a, computers are a lot much, much faster. Servers are much faster. So whereas it maybe it used to take maybe 50% of the load on your server would be doing handling SSL, now it's probably about 1%. So again, you've got less excuse now not to have it. So once you have SSL, um, then you can do something like this. This, this is HTTP basic auth is, is a way that you can just sort of have a standard way of identifying who the client is every time with every request. And the whole industry went away from that and said that's too basic, we can't rely on, we don't want to be sending the password every time. So you know, more fancy ways were, were come up, people came up with more fancy ways to do it. Now there's a little bit of a turn back and people are saying, well, if you have to send the password once anyway, someone could see that, so you better make sure it's all locked down anyway. And if you're going to do that, it's a lot easier to send it every time. Um, you may not want to do that. You may also still want to use a kind of token-based approach. But either way, um, you need to be authenticating every request every time and you need to be doing it over SSL so that no one else could uh, get hold of that and even if it's a token so they couldn't replay and, and run the same sorts of uh, queries again. Uh, and then uh, more sophisticated ways of doing it, um, as you guys have all seen this kind of permission dialogue you get on Twitter for with, if you're authenticating through Twitter or Google Plus or whatever is just, you know, the, you're basically going to, the, the user is saying that they, they're letting these two cloud, service in, two cloud services interop with each other. That's for, with, with OAuth. Another concern, apart from security, is, is the whole business of performance and scalability. 
And, uh, and as, as always with these things, it's worth bearing in mind um, Donald New's old principle of uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, very true, especially for those of you who are doing just experimental projects or working on startups. Um, I'm definitely going to say, like, don't do too much on thinking about performance up front because, um, you know, you want your project to be actually used at all before you have to worry about things like that. But once you do get to a certain level, there's a couple of things to consider. Performance is kind of like the time it takes, you know, for, to, to get responses and, of course, uses like nice, quick responses. Scalability is more about how you're dealing with multiple clients at the same time or hitting your server. And they have a, an interesting relationship. Um, in, in short terms, basically, if you can make your server faster, not only will your user be happy, but you can actually serve a lot more users too with, with a, a, assuming a constant server load. Uh, so caching, yeah, you can see it. Anyway, caching, um, caching is kind of the, the fundamental way that you can improve uh, performance within your web apps and APIs. And uh, the basic principle, of course, is that you, know, that you, want, you want it so that the user only requests something once and then comes down and it's there for life. Um, what I tend to do is I follow this one plus n pattern. So I'm talking about here because I don't think people really talk about it in these terms enough, but I think a fundamental way to do it, um, you see this with, with tools like Rails and Node have got their asset pipelines for doing this. Basically, um, what it's doing is it's getting a fresh version of the HTML, the fundamental web page, every single time, right? So that's never cached. And then uh, the, the CSS, the JavaScript, and any kind of images or assets the pages need, they're actually versioned or time-stamped. So we give a, a unique resource. If those ever change, we will change the URL, right? We'll change the, the way that we're identifying it. And if you do that, that means that these things can actually be cached forever. Uh, technically, it's a one-year limit, but you can conceptually, it's basically forever. Um, so you assume, you know, this is like this is not just the CSS for the website. This is the CSS for the website five minutes ago, right? And it's always going to be the CSS for the website at that time. It's never going to change. It's it's actually up to the root element to decide, to say like, okay, I know that the CSS has changed, so now I'm gonna send you a new version. I'm gonna send you the CSS for, for, uh, for, the, for the current time. And so that old one will just sit in all these caches and it'll hang around for a bit and eventually no one will use it, so it'll just atrophy away. All the, other, all the newer versions will just push it out. So you don't actually have to go around about and, and kind of explicitly expire all those old uh, resources. Um, that's that's kind of how a lot of these protocols were designed. They were designed for scaling. It's it's very hard to go around to all these different caches around the world that these old versions of the resources might have been cached at and, and ask them to can you please clear that. So you don't do that. Instead, you just you just basically assume they're around forever and never never ask never request them again. You keep the versions going up to date. So this all applies to APIs too. And we actually do this with Player FM. It really helps with scalability because we only have to serve any kind of channel, um, which is kind of like a, a bit of audio about, about some topic. We only ever have to serve that once from our server. And then we can rely on it being cached at the edge near the user and on their, on their phone or their, the web browser. It'll always be cached forever. Um, so the way we do this is the user requests their information. And that is going to be always fresh, right? So that, that will go straight to the server every time. Um, the server um, can, of course, still make a, take advantage of caching at some level. Maybe it, it can store that in memcache and it, it can know whether that's changed or not. But that's kind of beside the point. Um, the main thing is we get, that, we get that once and we get that fresh every hour or every four hours, whatever, whatever period the user wants to poll for their data. Once that's there, that's referring to all these other resources, and those resources are the things that are cached forever. Um, so you've got you know topics like maybe baseball, economics, tech, whatever the user's interested in, whatever the user's subscribed to, those are all versions. So uh, let's say the baseball ch baseball channel uh, gets a new episode in, and that, that's that's now at that time that's going to be the latest version of the baseball channel. So the first user who requests it after that new episode comes in, we're going to mark that as our version. We can call it version one if you like, and then. The second user who, who, who asks for that, 
it, they'll also get version one. So that can be cached somewhere else, like off off the server. If we use the right the right headers, that will be pushed somewhere near the user, and we don't have to worry about it. Furthermore, when the, the when the first user comes back and they ask for baseball again, we can say it hasn't changed since last time, so we'll still we'll still be pointing to the same version, and they won't end up requesting it at all. Uh, so again, it's been a very powerful way to just um, scale things um, and and only have to serve things once after they change, and then everything else is cached. So talk a little bit about tools. Um, I think tools are uh, something you should be taking advantage of when it comes to developing APIs. The most basic kind of tool is just raw file hosting, things like Amazon S3. Um, of course, we have Google. We have different ways of storing this with Google as well. And I think I'd like to see products like Google Drive, Dropbox, GitHub, in the future become very explicitly hosts because we're using them so much for passing files around anyway. Um, Google Drive kind of has it, but it's not really, it's not very explicit to my knowledge um, about you know, what the, what the uh, SLAs are and, and how much you can be serving. Um, I think that will change in the future. Then there are these edge caches. So I've sort of alluded to that in the previous point about performance, but you know, this, is, this is a very powerful thing to take advantage of is not just caching on your own server. So it's quite common now for people to use tools. Um, and by the way, I'm not talking much about Google Stack because I'm a Rails developer and, and uh, I can't take advantage of a lot of that. But um, So this is kind of just talking about general, um, you know, raw commodity type hosting. Um, so it's quite common for people to use tools like Varnish, right? And they'll, they'll use that on their own server. Um, but if you're using these kind of edge caches, you get the advantage of having having the content very close to the user as well. Um, so you might have something like Cloudflare. I think they've um, that's what that's what we use with Player FM is Cloudflare. Um, I think they've got about 19 different centers around the world. Um, so often, if someone's requesting something, they'll be getting they'll be getting it fresh from a server that's in their own country. That's a lot faster than if it was going all the way back to your own server. And uh, images, Cloudinary is quite a cool tool I use too. Um, it's becoming very common now because of responsive design that people need different size images. They want the same uh, raw source image, but they want it in different sizes, you know, maybe for a phone or a TV, tablet. So um, a lot of people are doing this now. They're writing proxies on the server. So you can actually just ask the server, give me this image, but, you know, give it to me in 400 by 200. And then you can ask later for give me this image, but give me 1200 by 800, whatever. It's the same image. Of course, you have to have it stored in a high quality on the server. And if you do that, Cloudinary will, will serve that. Um, what is also quite cool about Cloudinary is it proxies as well. So you can actually ask for any image, any, any image on, on the web, basically. And it will go and fetch it, um, resize it. Maybe even you can do things like annotate. It's kind of like image magic for those of you who have used image magic, you know, very much command line ma image manipulation, but it's done through the URL. So yeah, so I mean, I talked about edge caching. So that's, that's kind of how tools like Cloudflare work is, is, you know, they have, they might have different layers and you can do this too. You can set these, this up yourself. It's, it's just that a lot of those tools can make it a lot faster to set up. An interesting point arises here because I've mentioned before that everything's going SSL these days. And so it begs the question, if everything is SSL, how can you actually cache anything? Traditionally, SSL was kind of like means nothing gets cached ever. That's changed quite a bit. Um, browsers now do cache SSL. Pretty much all browsers, I think, will cache uh, secure content. Um, and along the way, um, you can do this, of course, on your own servers. You can set things up so that um, your own servers are trusted and they can actually cache that secure content. This is what you can also do with tools like Cloudflare. And it's a, it's, it is a trade-off, it's not perfect. But of course, if you want to have no SSL, that's fine. You can just cache without SSL. Um, but then what you can do is you can actually set it up so that Cloudflare has a, a secure link. Um, and the argument, and, and so, well, Cloudflare has a secure link um, between the user and Cloudflare and the server doesn't. So the server is just a normal old server. Um, but then Cloudflare puts this secure layer around it. So then, of course, you're trusting all this, the, the sort of telco infrastructure um, at a deep level that Cloudflare's hooked into. You're trusting that to, to see the, the traffic potentially open. If you don't want to trust that, then you can actually make your server SSL like it normally would be. But 
uh, give Cloudflare the, the access so that Cloudflare can still see your traffic and it can actually cache it. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, this is a trade-off, of course, because you, you're still trusting Cloudflare in this scenario. Um, so it's up to you to decide if it's worth the benefits. But like I say, you know, th there are great benefits of doing this because Cloudflare's got, you know, 20 different data centers that would be very hard for any individual company to set up. Server monitoring is also pretty important when you have a live API. Um, there are tools like Pingdom, um, Montastic. Traditionally, these are tools for, for monitoring websites, but there's no reason why they can't monitor a, uh, a, a live API as well. Well, actually, there might be, which is the previous point about authentication, but depending on if you've got things set up right um, and, and you're, you're, you've got very simple API calls, then you can actually do that. You can actually get them to, to, uh, to monitor endpoints of your API and then you'll you'll be alerted if those things go down you can get a text message for instance and also you can um, you can get sort of reports right about about kind of uh, how fast they're going and if, if there seem to be any issues capacity planning and alert so I use this tool called scout I'm sure there are other tools as well um, but again very powerful it monitors things like your server uptime um, you can do this yourself too. You can install tools like Moonin, um, but it's quite nice to be able to just drop this in. You just drop it onto your server. In this case, you drop it on as a, as a Ruby gem, I think, from memory. <laughs> it's been a while since I set it up, but it's basically, you know, it sits on the server and then and then it sends information every few minutes to their own servers, and so that builds up. They they build up a database. Of, of snapshots of, of what your server is doing at any time, and then you can later come on, come along and get a chart, and uh, and get graphs, and you can get you can get reports. So um, it, again, with scaling, one of the challenges is is you always have to be planning in advance. You don't want to you don't want to wait till your server goes down before you decide you need to uh, to maybe scale and get some new servers in or increase capacity. So you need to know these things in advance. So tools like, like Scout can really help with that because they can actually um, send you early alerts that, you know, it seems like your uptime's now triple this week, so you better do something about it. Um, client side and, and server side exception reporting and logging general, logging in general. These are these are tools like exceptional, Raygun, there's also Logly. You know, these are tools that are helping you uh, capture your logs in a way that they give you much better user interfaces than just raw text files. So raw text files can be great and you can run grep tools and so on, but it can also be quite nice to have this whole suite of, of web services that have already been built to analyze your data and traffic and, and things like exceptions. Um, in the case of exceptional, I actually use that, <coughs> excuse me, I use that um, for uh, client side exceptions as well. So with JavaScript, um, when there are JavaScript exceptions on your web page, you can also be alerted that way. And a final tool there is really a nice tool, New Relic. Again, there are other alternatives, but I use New Relic um, for monitoring performance and it really gives you um, nice stats about you know what are the the it's not just sort of like a big table of everything that's going on it's actually quite helpful because it tells you what are the most the, the most important things to worry about so it's kind of a combination of how slow things might be running as well as how many times they're actually running this is an example um, so this was um kind of an epic win where where I had some issues with a server and uh, if you look at the chart, <laughs> this is kind of this, this one call that was being made. And, and that's, you can see what happened as soon as I turned it off. <laughs> um, it, was actually, it was actually a very expensive call that was being made all the time. That was, you know, like a, a very common call. So it was like the, the exact example of low-hanging fruit because, because, you know, just by caching this one thing that didn't, need, that didn't actually change very often, um, it kind of it was actually taking up if you look at it fifty percent of the server load, so it basically doubled the server's efficiency and and having a chart like that really helps so uh, there are some tools for actually manipulating HTTP um, and sort of simulating what your what your clients will be doing. I recommend using HTTP Pi as an alternative to curl. Most of you probably use curl and you you have to do a search just to find out how to, um, you know, how to how to do a put or a delete or something because it's just it's just this ridiculously obscure set of flags. So if you want to if you want to make calls against an API, I thoroughly recommend looking into HTTP Pi. It's really easy to set up and um, and a lot easier. I'll show you an example in a sec. Uh, UniREST is one to keep your eyes on because it's actually 
trying to make a RESTful library that actually works across different programming languages. So they'll all use basically the same same kind of commands, same same patterns of how they'll interact. Um, because you know every every programming language has got 50 different REST clients, and it would be nice to standardize those a bit. There's also this new category of products that are actually like paste bins um, for API calls. So, so if you make some interesting API call and you're interested in the requests and the responses and the headers that came out, you can actually capture that um, on a website somewhere. You get a unique URL and then you can show someone else, you know, it's funny, like I called Flickr and look at the header that came out or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then there's... there's um, yeah, so this is command line. Sorry, it's a bit small, but um, just showing you um, again. If you've used curl, you, you'll see how much simpler this is. You can do something like HTTP put example.com slash accounts amount colon one thousand bonus colon true. So that's uploading a document. Um, just really simple. Just way way simpler than than doing it with with um, curl or, or wget or whatever. Um, there are also these tools for API hosting. I haven't used any myself, but you know, again, th these are the kinds of people when I'm talking about an API bubble that you hear a lot about. I listen to a podcast called Structure, uh, the Gigaroam podcast. Uh, they talk a lot about these companies here as well. Um, it's becoming a really big area for companies basically to act as a middleman between your API and the clients, your, your end clients. And they can add a lot of value because they can do things like caching, like I mentioned, but also because they know it's an API and the way that APIs are meant to work, they can also help you with uh, generating documents, uh, checking how much each user is using your API, and they can put limits and potentially charge users for it, um, testing, debugging. So there's a lot of things, a lot of ways they can add value. Um, this is from one of them, I think, Apogee. So they, they will generate these docs for you. Um, and generate these tools for, to let users like a kind of playground for your API. You don't actually have to create the playground yourself. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in uh, 2013. It's been quite a while since REST really got started and, and around late 90s really. It's starting to change quite a bit. So let's look at where, where it sort of came from. So starting off with um, around the year 2000, this is, was roughly this era of, uh, of WS Star, otherwise known as Destar. Uh, quite a complicated set of protocols and, uh, and trying to come up with this, you know, the programmers and, and uh, develop, like, um, tool developers have always had this fantasy that you can just, you know, we'll create this object-oriented model and we'll have these objects and we'll just push a button and now our objects are an API. That's great. And that was kind of, it was pursuing this thing. It's like, there's a long history of this with COBOL and everything. You can tell my attitude to this, a little bit biased. Other people would say this is a good idea still. But it's just in practice, it, it often hasn't worked out too well. Because um, there has just been too many devils in the detail for this sort of thing. And it applied a little bit too much structure. And it was kind of vendor-driven development. It's, it's a very attractive thing for, for vendors, but not always for developers. So, uh, let's... Uh, yeah, so about 10 years later, it's, things had changed quite radically. So REST became really, really big. Um, and instead of just doing things like, um, like you know, having, having sort of like big fat XML documents that had to be very strictly structured, um, we had just, you know, JSON, lightweight JSON being passed around. I mentioned already the importance of resources. This is how the HTTP protocol works, how the, the web works. And so it's working, it's working with the flow of the web, if you like. Um, it's less about exposing services that objects in your system might have, happen to, to have, like the methods on your objects. And it's more about conceptualizing your, your, your API, your server, as a set of resources. That's just a different worldview from what we were looking at in the past. It's also just a simpler approach. Um, yeah, sort of speaks for itself, really. It's patterns um, based, so it's, it's much more based on just doing things in a kind of common industry way than having very strict rules about how everything has to work. It's building, or it's, instead of building on top of HTTP, which a lot of the, the former protocols were doing and trying to come up with their own new protocols, it's really just saying, like, actually, HTTP has been designed with all these users in mind. Um, 
a little bit, again, just to relate it to the previous talk on web components, um, it's a little bit like how web components are now in the browser. So it's actually, um, it's actually doing what the libraries were previously doing. The libraries were sort of building on top of the browser. Now you don't need a lot of those libraries. Same sort of thing here. Um, if you actually take advantage of HTTP because it has been designed to do all the things you want to do with an API, then you don't need to actually build on top of API on top of HTTP. And uh, and you know we, we saw this massive change uh, from from XML to JSON as well. So you know uh, Doug Crockford introduced JSON as a fat-free alternative to XML, and uh, I think we can safely say you know it's kind of one for the most part. XML is still around in, in specific industries and domains, but most of the time everything is operating you know via JSON these days. As it's just a much simpler way of doing things. So what is happening in 2015? is um, things are changing a little bit, right? So it kind of got to this steady state. And of course, with technology, like no one's ever happy when it's in a steady state and everything's comfortable, right? We always want to do things a bit better. So, so now we're seeing the pendulum swing back a little bit um, towards some of the, the goals that, that um, the WS star had in mind. We're, we're seeing, for instance, uh, Netflix talked about this. This was actually a really, really good talk. I recommend um, if, you, if you can find it from uh, Netflix about their APIs. It's on Skills Matter if you Google for Skills Matter Netflix API. Basically, um, yeah, that, this is like, this is a pretty big growth. 70, 70 times growth in two years for API calls, right? And this is actually API calls. So they're kind of saying like, how could we deal with this? Of course, they're not going to change the number of users who are using their system or number of apps. That's kind of outside their control, but or at least it's outside the, the API developer's control. But the thing that they can control is actual requests, like actual specific uh, round trips back and forth to the server. Uh, and I think they gave an example of, of one particular use case where the user wants to do something. So the user might click a button, and then it does 14 requests back and forth. Um, so we see these situations, you know, where it might be the first request is to get a list of videos and the second request is going to be um, get me the images for each of the videos and the third request might be get me the user's uh, relationship to those videos, like have they uh, seen them in the past. So they would all be separate requests. I'm just making it up, but I know I see the same sort of thing with my API. Um, if you have a, you know, that, that's because it's fine-grained. So it is based very strictly on what I talked about before, which is let's say everything in our is is um, let's make our API full of things, basically. And then you end up having to call for all those different things individually. Um, you can certainly call for a collection of things, but it's going to be only one type of thing. Um, so like I say, you know, it might be get the videos first, then get the subscriptions, get the history. They're all separate calls and, and separate ways of changing them, uploading them as well. Um, so where that's all getting to is this idea of uh, let's actually look at what are the typical calls. Uh, again, look at low-hanging fruit, um, the, the calls that are frequently made, what are the things that users are doing the most, things like, you know, let's uh, show the user the home page, let's start a video, let's uh, let the user subscribe to something. If those things are taking multiple calls back and forth to the server, um, then that's going to be a bad user experience and it's going to be extra load on the server. So now they're actually changing this and they're actually, they're actually designing specific API endpoints to cover those typical use cases. I've seen other people talk about that too. It's a general trend. I think you can still do that restfully because you can actually create resources to represent that transaction. But uh, I don't know if everyone will do it restfully, but it's certainly, I think, a, a good idea to, to still do it restfully, represent the most common, um, most common use cases as, as objects, as resources in your system. There's also this kind of what I call a slow cooker revolution. And I think Google has been the masters of this with Google+, Plus, which I've followed pretty closely. Uh, what I mean by that is... Um, is you can see this how Google's done this that they've launched the Google the, the um, plus interface first so they're, they're focused very much on user experience first and uh, and making it of course you know user experience is a hard thing to do users are hard to predict um, hard to design for so getting that right uh, from the start is actually an important thing to do before you start to build an API because your API is going to be changing and it's going to break a lot of clients 
Um, this goes away. You know, there's always been this tension, this debate um, about what, how, where, when you should do your API. And there was, I think people sort of made this realization a few years ago, hey, we could do our API first. In fact, we could build a system without a user interface and we could just have an API. I, admit, I, I actually wrote a blog post about that at one point and I was saying, you know, it'd be cool if you had a wiki like Wikipedia, if it was just an API first, you know, just data manipulation and then anyone can write their own user interfaces and so on. But I think what we've learned from from some people trying those things is that that's the best way to get your API to break on every client because you're going to end up having to change it. You're going to end up learning so much about users in the first year or two of your system that that you may have committed to it prematurely. So, so we we've seen this with Google, right? So you know, um, sort of reverse engineering that process. It seems to be like they'll do that, and then they'll have a private API. So internally, they can have an API, and you may well have this right from the start. But again, you have to be prepared for your, your internal API is going to break a bit as you go along. Um, and it's a private API. It's just used by your own applications. No one else in the world is allowed to use it. And then you do. Yes, it's going to be starting to be public, but it's it's drip fed again. You can see this with Google. They have uh, all these partners like Fancy and Flixer and so on. All the usual suspects for those of us who are who active on Google+. And they're allowed access into the API first. And, and they're not going to go out and complain on Stack Overflow and whatever about how this Google API is broken, you know, because they're partners, they're trusted, and they, they, they want to help the, the platform get better. So they can work much closer with them. Um, and I think it's, it's a pretty logical way um, if you've got a long-term view for your API to actually release it in this sort of drip-fed way, um, as well as um, having limited features. So we've seen this with Google+. Plus. You know, it's, it's launched with pretty limited. It's just read-only, um, read-only access. And, uh, and so just, you know, just gradually putting it out there rather than just coming out straight away, as I think quite a lot of companies started doing a few years ago and still quite a few are doing today is like the first thing, like when you announce your new website, you're also coming out with, with an API. Um, it's just, you know, taking it slower is something I think we'll see more companies doing. Standardization. Um, JSON itself has actually been standardized pretty much now because um, it was a, always had some ambiguity. Uh, Swagger is an interesting one to watch. It seems to be a, a standard that's getting some momentum um, for, for, for doing sort of, it's more about orient around documentation, but I think it could grow to something more than that. Um, and it's a sort of standard way of defining your API. And, and HateOS is an interesting one. Um, it's been around since REST started. Um, it's basically the idea of, of a kind of auto-discovery mechanism, and it's this idea that you could have a client that can theoretically traverse your whole API and, and make one call and work out how to make another call from that. It is quite good if you if you make your client self-documenting. So if you have an API, it's quite good if, say, if there's an error, um, then you point the user to to a resource that, that would actually that they maybe want instead, or if you send a, if you serve a resource and then you anticipate what what is the next call the user might be making and you, you show some list of resources that are related to that. That's all good, but HateOS sort of takes that a step further and tries to automate a lot of it. Um, and it's just something I've noticed is there is kind of a bit of momentum back towards that that view. So again, it's kind of where, where we understand REST now and it seems to be working. People want to automate more of it and there are definitely a lot of vendors who are working on this sort of thing. Um, so some of the benefits will be things like interop, um, because if we're using similar ways of, of exposing our APIs, um, then they'll work, then all these different clients and libraries will work better together. Um, having a standard way of, of documenting, or sorry, of coding your, your uh, RESTful APIs will help you with document generation as well. So tools like Swagger are helping us to generate API docs automatically. And, uh, and maybe it will lead back to code generation as long as we're very, very careful about it. So I think that's it. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot more coming with APIs in the next few years and, and REST and so on. Um, cool. So we are kind of in, in our break time already, but I guess we have time for, for one or two small questions, if there are any. Right, right at the back. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I can make it a short question. Uh, regarding URIs or URLs, um, we 
quite often have internal discussions about the order. Just to give you an example, you have three uh, segments like users, um, folder, and picture, something like this. And you can you have six possibilities to order them. So you can also make folder, user, and something else. And um, when you have um, dynamic parts in your URI, like starting with the user ID slash folders, you have to be um, careful that you don't have collisions with keyboards. Here. Uh, keywords like no user does have an ID similar to events or something like this so you open a big box when you just want to make a small URI you have to think really a lot uh, what you do so do you have some kind of rule of thumb when you create a new URI to yeah. prevent collisions and something like this and the order and so I do. on um, yeah I think as a, a general rule of thumb, of course, this will depend a lot on your system, but a general rule of thumb is like slash user is a pretty much a, a standard now because so many sy systems are, are social and you want to have the users can get their own little namespace. So just as a rule of thumb, slash user is, is always a good one to start with. And, uh, and then you're talking about sort of like when you've got magic words effectively. Um, so you might have like slash mic slash bookmarks right but then uh, but then I can't create a bookmark a project called bookmarks because because every user has got slash mic slash bookmarks already um, so that is a problem it's kind of a, a matter of balancing between like you have to try to predict a lot of those at the start in fact I've got a, um, a list of reserved words in my app you know where I basically um, I just found like a whole ton of reserved words there's things like you I can kind of combine it with profanities you know like a profanity list um, a list of common reserve words and you can find these there are words like um like terms like um you know slash locale slash admin slash login all of these standard terms that you can actually block and then basically if you create that list and then you try to think about what are the things in your own uh, application as well or your own service that the entities that are important to you that you think maybe now or maybe one day you'll want to uh, create as like magic terms in the url create you know put them all into a big a big hash or array and then basically don't let users create projects with those names basically one more <laughs> in the example you showed us with the caching of so you, you deliver user.json and then you have this um, baseball dot letters dot JSON um, in the user dot JSON do you give it the identifier with the letters or do you give the identifier of baseball dot JSON and then do a redirect uh, so if I understand you're talking about the request for that um, the no in the response of Joe dot JSON the URL you gave to yeah. baseball is it this or is it uh, do you redirect to it uh, it's not redirect. Um, generally, APIs and redirections don't go well together because clients, in theory, they could, right? Because a redirect would be quite a, a convenient um, uh, sort of standard way of telling a client it's over there, you know, because it's always good to use these standards where you can. But unfortunately, a lot of clients will automatically, they try to be helpful, so they'll automatically redirect. Um, if you use a lot of standard clients and the way even browsers um, with puts and deletes, um, it's kind of actually part of the standard that they're supposed to redirect and they don't even get as a client you don't even get a chance to see what was in that in that initial call and you don't get a chance to to uh to block it from redirecting so in reality um you can't really use redirects in an api so therefore it, it, it's kind of a conceptual redirect but in practice um it's just a list of of the resources and each of those resources is kind of a sub uh nested json which will give the the latest URL, so the client can keep that as well in case it, you know, like an, an hour later, or no, sorry, you know, days later when it's not cached, if it doesn't have it, then it will just ask for the canonical version, because um, there is still a canonical version. Clients can ask for if they if they want, but then of course it will have it will come back with that, but also the timestamps version. Thanks. Sorry, I've gone over time, but I'm around anyway. If, if um, yeah, thank you.